I would encourage everyone to open up in their Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. That's where we're going to be at in just a minute. Matthew chapter 7. Reading from the end of arguably the greatest sermon. Actually, it's not arguably. It is the greatest sermon that's ever been spoken, ever been written. Sermon on the Mount. We're going to finish with that. Or we're going to start with that in just a couple of seconds. I forgot to mention to Ken earlier, in case anyone was wondering, that Levi is sick. That's where he and both Melina, him and Melina are both at this morning. So if anybody asks, that's where they're at. I didn't just leave them in the car. I Hopefully nobody actually thinks that. Um, before we jump into it this morning, I do feel like it's important to say at least a little something about Shane and Kelly Carrington. They're, they're both great people. We've all known them. Most of us here have known them. If not for any number of years, most of us have known them for probably their whole lives. And when I first moved here almost 13, 14 years ago, Shane was one of the first people that reached out to me. He's one of the first people I got to meet literally, I think, the first week that I got here. And I knew Kelly kind of through Shane, and Shane and I have always been very close. Shane is very much an extrovert, as anybody that knows them knows. I'm very much an introvert. If you know me, I'd rather kind of stay inside my little cocoon and just kind of stay there. Shane reached in that cocoon and grabbed and yanked me out. And so for the last 13 and a half, 14 years, it's really been a distinct pleasure of mine to get to know both of them. They're both just such fantastic people. And I think what's both been most eye-opening to me, and it's certainly been a learning experience to me, and I know everybody else has, is... If you've gotten those emails from Shane about Kelly over the last four and a half years, one of the things I think you probably have noticed is their utter resolve and hope. You know, when I talked to Shane and Kelly literally a week ago, maybe three or four days before she passed away, Kelly asked me about my life. She didn't ever once have any fear, any ounce of of trepidation or nervousness. And I think that's a testament to a Christian life that's well lived. And that's a testament to both of them. And that's something that I think both of us or all of us will remember about them I think it's important, since we all know them, to just kind of say that about them, is that they're an example to us. We love them very much, and that will be a loss that will be deeply felt within this area and within also this church. To switch from something that is very somber to something that is very lighthearted, most of you know that Melina went back to work in the fall. She's a teacher at Lamar. She's teaching music. Most of us are aware of that. Most of you also know that it's ever since then, I have had the distinct pleasure of getting to be around Levi literally 24-7 24-7 every single week since that point. And when I first thought about how this was all going to go, I thought, well, this can be great. We're going to play some cars. I'm going to do a little work. We're going to play some more cars, play some work. That's not really at all how life with a three-year-old goes when you're trying to work from home, in case you're wondering. What I've realized is that Levi has more questions than Wikipedia has answers. That's one of the things that I've learned this year. For instance, this is a laundry list of some of the questions that he asked. First and foremost, he asked the question, Daddy, where does milk come from? So we pulled up YouTube video. We talked all about that. We went all through Wikipedia. We talked that. Next question. Daddy, is milk supposed to be white? Well, I think so. I don't really know. I'm not a farmer, so I think it is. Daddy, why are my pants inside out? I don't know. I told you that a couple hours ago that your pants were inside out. Daddy, why do my pants have pockets? I don't know. Some guy decided that they needed pockets. Daddy, why do we even have pockets? I don't know. To carry stuff. Daddy, what can I put in my pockets? Anything you want to put in your pockets. Daddy, how many pockets do you have? I don't know. Three, four, maybe? I don't know. Daddy, how many pockets do I have? Daddy, how many pockets does Logan have? Daddy, how many pockets am I supposed to have? When I tell you the, po- the pocket questions are endless, I mean the pocket questions are endless. And I eventually got to a point, as I think every parent does, and one thing, one point that I promised myself I would never get to, I had to use the inevitable answer, which is because I said so. I don't know why. They just do because I said so. And I promised myself that I would never get to that point because I think for me, at least, it always kind of seems like kind of a cop-out answer. You have the answer. You just don't really want to tell me. And I, Levi's three years old, so obviously it doesn't get to that point very often. We don't have very in-depth discussions about my parenting. But you have to use an answer sometimes every once in a while. Sometimes, though, with questions that we have with life, answers like that just don't really fit the bill. And I think when we ask questions predominantly about our faith, when we ask questions about the Bible, when we ask questions about our role in the universe, if you will, all questions that obviously Levi is asking right now, but when we ask ourselves the really big questions, answers like that just don't really seem to work. For instance, when we ask the question, which is really the question we're going to ask this morning, we ask the question, why are we here? And I don't mean here at Hillside. I mean, why are we here in this universe? These are questions that have really, really, really big answers. And when we look in Scripture, we see some of these questions answered. For instance, when you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God answers this question very early in the beginning when he says, We are created in man's and in God's image to rule over the earth and have dominion over the creation. Those are two answers that God gives us right at the outset. 
For instance, number one, he says you were created in God's image, which is a whole other sermon that we're going to have next month. I think that phrase is really fascinating. But number two, he says to have dominion over the creation, to rule over it, to keep it, to tend to it. There is an authority that we as human beings have that nothing else of God's creation has, which carries with it a responsibility. And so you can make the argument that we are, at least in some sense of the word, stewards of our environment. That's one of the purposes. You can also make the argument from Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Paul makes this very simply when he says, All things were created for him and by him. Everything that we have and do and are is to God's glory. There's no question about that. That's one of the reasons we sing the songs. It's one of the reasons we read the verses. It's one of the reasons we talk and grow and resist temptations is because our lives are living embodiments to the ultimate glory of God. That's at least in some way the way that we should view ourselves. Revelation reiterates this point. In chapter 4 and verse 11, he says, All things were created by his will for the sake of serving him and glorifying him. So everything about our lives begins and ends, you could argue, with the glorification of God. And I think if I were to get up here, somebody were asking me the question, Well, Brady, why are we here? These questions would probably suffice for the vast majority of the people in this room. Most of us in this room are already Christians. So we're Christians and we already have accepted the fact, number one, that there is a God. Number two, that he is holy, that he is mighty, that he is universal, that he is omniscient, omnipotent. And so our lives being glorification vessels to him doesn't bother us. I would wager, though, that that question, the answer that I just gave you, because they're all to the glory of God, that doesn't fly with a lot of people. That a lot of atheists and certainly a lot of agnostics, and I've found agnostics sometimes are the tougher nuts to crack, that agnostics and atheists don't like these types of answers. And I'll be honest with you, I don't blame them. Because if you are operating from a position where you question the authority of the Bible at all, then of course you're not going to turn to the Bible for the authoritative answer to your question, if that makes any sense. You're going to look for other things. And so you have to ask the question, or you have to look, when you, when you ask the question, why are you here? You have to look at other sources. For instance, you can look at the example of history. And I will be the first person to tell you that I think history is the closest thing to a crystal ball that we have in this universe. Because history tells us exactly how man lives. It tells us much of the motivations to that. It tells us basically the greatest hits of the entire scope of history. And it tells us the ramification of those choices. This is where every history buff in the auditorium can scream amen. I was kind of counting on it at that point. But history has its limitations. History really only tells us what happened. It tells us that Alexander the Great ruled a third of the known world at that point. It tells us that the Roman Caesarian dynasty ruled for roughly 250 years. It tells us those types of things. But it doesn't really answer the why question. And likewise, science really only tells us the processes by which something happened. This gets a little bit closer to it. That science can tell us that all these things happen and also can tell us on a molecular level how these things took place and this happened, this happened, this happened. But it still can't answer the question of why. Someone would argue, well, philosophy gets to that point. Philosophy only tells us how to think, though, about what happened. If you would take for granted, for instance, the idea that you're living in this universe, then the question that philosophy answers is, how do I interact with this universe? If you were to dive really hardcore into Stoicism, if you were diving really hardcore into Epicureanism or any Buddhism or any other kind of life philosophy, you would have a really good basis for how to interact with the world around you, but you still wouldn't have the answer to why. Why life? Why existence? Why this world? Why me? Why you? Why this right now? Now, I don't want to deprecate any of this. I believe that science and philosophy and history, I believe that these disciplines have their purposes. I believe they're very valuable. I believe that all of us can do a great deal of service to ourselves in exploring these, but we have to understand the limitations of these things. As a matter of fact, Albert Camus, who was one of the principal philosophers of the last 200 years, had this to say. He said, and listen to this, he said, if we believe in nothing, if nothing has any meaning, and if we can affirm no values whatsoever then everything is possible and nothing has any importance. Let me read that to you again. If we believe in nothing, if nothing has any meaning, and if we can affirm no values whatsoever, then everything is possible and nothing has any importance. That's a philosopher that is talking about this question of why are we here. If we agree, if we as philosophers, if we as scientists, historians, if we as human beings say that there is no value whatsoever, then everything is permitted. And that's why I think when we try to answer this question, this isn't necessarily a sermon that addresses the answer of why we're here as much as how to approach this question. If we're answering this question of why we're here, 
The philosopher Albert Camus said it perfectly. The first thing we need, ladies and gentlemen, is we need some kind of foundation. If we don't have any kind of foundation by which to build our life off of, then we are literally anarchists living in a world of chaos. Because who's to say that your world is any better than mine? Who's to say that the Bible is any better than the other person's? And here's the kicker with all of this. You already, whether you realize it, have a foundation or not. Whether that foundation was given to you by your parents, whether that foundation was given to you by your culture, by your society, you have a foundation by which you are building your life. The question is, which foundation are you using to build your life? In Matthew chapter 7, starting verse 24, I love this description because after this super authoritative sermon where Jesus talks about the extents of the law and the real meaning behind the law, he then backs it up a little bit. And he challenges everybody to think about the practical applications of what he's just said. Listen to verse 24. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been found on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine, verse 26, and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, they slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Do not mistake which camp Jesus is in. Jesus has firmly established himself, and I am too, and hopefully all of us as Christians are. He has firmly established himself as God's foundation is the only one that matters. And I think that's a very valid reason. Because if you base your foundation off of somebody like Buddha, if you value your found, or build your foundation off of somebody like Gandhi, if you, value, if you build your foundation on somebody like Karl Marx, you are going to have, or you're going to find out that the strength of that building depends on that one man. And that's also what Jesus addresses in here. Because if you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, he doesn't necessarily talk about the do's and don'ts as much as he puts an object lesson. He says it's the same house. You have the same house. You have the same storm. You have the same person. But the difference is, you have the same weather. I forgot to mention that. The difference is the foundation. And when the foundation or whenever the storms come, whatever the exterior looks like, those foundations are revealed. And it may be, and I'm not signaling the end of the sermon when I say this, but it may be that you are right now in a period of a trial in your life where you're really starting to second-guess some things. Or your world has been shattered, your world has been shaken, maybe there's been some grief, maybe there's been some loss. And so what you're finding out in this moment is exactly how deep your foundation is built. You're finding out exactly how deep your roots are. The wrong time, ladies and gentlemen, to find out how strong your foundation is, is when you're in the middle of a hurricane. And what Jesus challenges us to do in Matthew chapter 7, number one, is build on the only foundation that matters. But number two, build your foundation deep. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 73. Look in Psalm 73 if you would. In Psalm 73, starting in verse 25. You find this a lot when the psalm, or in the psalms. You find the psalmist that almost reach a point within their psalms where they really can't go anymore. They go to the end of whatever their line of reasoning is, and then they look back and they think, okay, what's the thousand-foot, million-foot view of this? And that's kind of what the psalmist does here in Psalm 73. Look in verse 25. He hits this point in this psalm where he takes a step back, and he says in verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. My God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish, and you have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. What the psalmist finds out here in Psalm 73 is almost exactly what all the psalmists find out. When they take this step back and they examine life as it is, they say to themselves, there's a lot of things that fall by the wayside. The enemies of God, they're gone. The riches of this world, they fall away. My own health sometimes can deprecate to the point where even I don't appreciate it anymore. But God, as my refuge, is repeated more than 20 times within the psalmist. Because over and over again, what the psalmist finds is that once everything is stripped away... The only thing that's really eternal is God himself. And so when you ask this question of why are you here, you have to start fundamentally from a position of strength. What is the most sure foundation that I can? And I think we find once we dive into scripture, as Peter talks about, if you have tasted that the mercies of the Lord are sure, what we find is that God provides the most sure foundation. But you also have to have contentment. I found as in my old age, this is where the laughter comes in, <laughs> 
I've found in my old age that the older I get, the more important can something like contentment is. Because when we think back about the questions that we mentioned at the beginning, and I brought up Levi as a very humorous example, when you ask, when you look at the example of Levi, we never really grow out of that situation, do we? We don't ever still ask the questions about pockets. We may not ask about milk. We may not ask about these other things. But we're still asking questions. And some of these questions are fundamental. Some of these questions need to be asked for the security of our own soul because we genuinely want to know. Some of these questions sometimes can be more or less distracting to us. We just ask them because we don't really want the real answer because when we get the real answer, we don't really want the ramifications for our lives. And when Solomon examines all of this, look at how he ends it in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting verse 9, he says, In addition to being a wise man, love how he just kind of talks about himself like that. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. He pondered, he searched out, he arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and write words of truth correctly. And that is true. If you read 1 Kings chapter 10, 1 Kings chapter 11, you find out that Solomon wrote hundreds and thousands of psalms and proverbs. He was no slack when it came to study. And what he found out in verse 11 is the words of the wise men are like goads. The masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They're given by one shepherd. He's talking deliberately about God. But beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless. Excessive devotion of books is wearisome to the flesh. What Solomon found out in verses 12 through 13 is that you can spend your whole life reading, unreading, reading again, all these different philosophies, these different books, these different things, and people have done that. And what you'll find out, Solomon says, is there's a lot of fluff. But every once in a while, you come across those golden nuggets that really hit home with you. And when you look at verse 11, the way he phrases it, he says that's exactly how God's word is. God's word is like well-driven nails. You don't have everything that's ever been written, but you have 100% of what's necessary for your life. But look at what he says in verse 12. When he talks about the writing of many books is endless and this excessive devotion to books is wearisome of the body, nobody knows that any better than Solomon who spent his entire life in study, who spent his entire life in science where he was trying to analyze, certainly through the book of Ecclesiastes, what the real heart of mankind was. And what he found at the end was that he was just tired. It just wore him straight out. And I always think about Acts chapter 26 and verse 24, whenever Paul is giving his third defense here at the last third of the book of Acts, when he's given his last defense before Festus, he's talking, he's talking, he's talking, and then he hits the resurrection. You remember what Festus tells him? When he brings up the resurrection, Festus stops him and he says, Paul, you are outside of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. That is a very real possibility. Have you ever met anybody like that? Somebody who reads and studies and thinks so much that the ideas they come up with just defy logic. They don't really make any kind of sense. At some point, what we need to be, ladies and gentlemen, is content with the answers that we have. And you see that, for instance, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We deliberately stopped before he gave us the final answers, which we're here in verse 13 and 14. He says the conclusion, when all has been heard, after you've studied everything that life has to offer, the answer is to fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. Why? Because verse 14, God will bring every act of judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. That's really all that matters. Your cars don't matter. My cars don't matter. That hurts because I love my Bronco. My car doesn't matter. Your hobbies don't matter. Your job title doesn't matter. Fearing God and keeping his commandments, that's what matters. And here's the million-dollar question for each of us to ponder as we examine this. Is that answer enough for you? Is that answer enough for me? Because there are some people that say that's not enough. And there are also some people that will say, well, I understand that. I'm cool with that. And I'm willing to dive into this religious aspect a little bit more. But I, I just feel like I still have all these other questions. And once I get the answers I'm searching for... Well, that's fine with me. All I need to hear is the answers to my questions. And once I get those answers, then everything's good. I have one question for you. Are you sure about that? Look in John, the ninth chapter. In John chapter 9, this is... And Nathan always makes fun of me. This is my favorite chapter in John. I love this chapter. Because this is the one moment in John where Jesus doesn't dominate the conversation. Not that I don't want Jesus to dominate the conversation. But the reason I love this chapter so much is because Jesus allows other people to dominate the conversation for him. This is the story we studied about at last quarter in the book of John. This is a story where a man is born blind. Very simple illustration. Man's born blind. Jesus heals him. That's the first seven, eight verses in a nutshell. Starting in verse 13, the Pharisees are trying to figure out what's going on. They really don't, can't come to terms with this. 
Verse 13, they brought the Pharisees, or to the Pharisees, the man who was formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath day on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. That's a very important nugget for the story. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received the sight. We want to know the answer. Just answer us. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, I wash and I see. That's it. That's literally all that happened. Well, some of the Pharisees were saying, verse 16, this man isn't from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. Notice how the Pharisees are searching for an answer. Notice also how the blind man gives them answers. And the Pharisees, because of the foundation that they're operating off of, automatically discredit that answer. The blind man has nothing to gain from this. He's already got his sight. What's really at stake here? What's at stake here is the Pharisees are not happy with the answer that they're given. If you jump down to verse 23... His parents respond back after they interrogate them. His parents ask again, he's of age, just ask him. We don't know what happened, ask him. him." The blind man steps up late, verse 24, a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. We've already assumed that. That's the foundation we're operating off of. He then answered, well, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, I, I see. I know that much, the blind man says. Verse 26, so they said to him, what did he say to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? That really just twists the knife on them. They reviled him and they said to him, you are his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he's from. The man answered and said to them, and the gall of this man, the courage of this man, verse 30, to stand up and say, well, here's an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from. And yet he opened my eyes. Do you notice how the Pharisees act a lot like people in today's world? And I can be like this. We can all be like this at various points in time. Do you notice how the Pharisees operate exactly how some people in the world today operate? Where they say, if you just give me an answer, then I'll believe everything. Okay, well, here's the answer. Seriously, just give me an answer. Okay, here's the answer. Would you just give me an answer? I've given you 12 answers. And you're not satisfied with any of them. In case you're wondering, this is exactly what's going to happen during the trial of Jesus when they ask him, are you the Christ? Are you really he? And he says, I told you it in the temple. I told you it on the hill. I told you it ever. I told you it over and over again. You're just not listening to me. At some point, ladies and gentlemen, we need contentment with the answers. Not because we're scared of giving more answers, but because that is the answer. And there are some people, and we can be like this too, there are some people who don't want the answer because they don't want to come to grips with what that answer means for their life. Because it's far more distracting And it's far more simple to keep asking questions and, quote, be unsure and thrive in uncertainty than accept the answer and do something with it. That requires courage, whereas the other one thrives in uncertainty. And those are the exact same people that will stand before God on the day of judgment and say, well, God, if you had just explained it to me in a way that I could understand, we wouldn't be in this pickle, would we? And God's going to metaphorically drop the Bible and say, I gave you this. The problem was you just weren't content with it. We also need a purpose. God's given us a purpose. God has given us a purpose not only collectively as a body of people, he's also given us a purpose individually. I want you to look at Luke, the 12th chapter. Some of these parables, I think sometimes we we read them and we kind of relegate them to stories and we move on with our life. But slow down and see really what's happening here in Luke, the 12th chapter. Luke, chapter 12, starting in verse 15. This is after the discussion about man divide, or Jesus divide up the inheritance. This guy is stealing my inheritance. Verse 15, he says, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. I want to read that verse again. Because he says in verse 15, and if you wonder on or highlight or think about, meditate on, this is that half of that verse I want you to focus on. Verse 15, For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Your money doesn't define you. Your job doesn't define you. And you know why? Because of what he says in verse 16. Verse 16, he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. That defined him. That was who he was. He began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, this is what I'm going to do. This is my next course of action. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will then turn and say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. 
I would bet that whenever this rich man walks throughout his local municipality, maybe he is a mayor, maybe he's just a really rich guy that sponsors all the local sports teams, whatever his situation is. I would imagine when this guy walks through his local municipality and they say, well, that's that guy. And they say, well, who is that guy? Oh, he's blank. And I would bet you most often times the blank that is filled in there is something along the words of that's a really rich guy or that's a wealthy business owner or that's a wealthy rancher or something like that. And those phrases that we use to define ourselves, God says, don't really define us. And that's because in this parable, whenever God comes to him and says, this grand plan that you had to expand your identity by way of these buildings and these farms, that's all going to be stripped from you. And you're going to meet me tomorrow. And when I meet you tomorrow morning in judgment, when you stand before me, or when you stand before me in judgment day, whenever that day is, when you stand before me, I'm going to ask you one more time, who are you? And verse 21 says, even when you're rich, that doesn't really matter if you're not rich towards God. And so I ask you the question this morning, not ending once again, I mean to put a sign or a button up here, it's not the ending. What defines you? What is your purpose? What is your life? If someone were to say, and I'll just pick on Levi because he picked on me during class. If I said, that's Levi right there. Levi is a blank. How does Levi fill in that blank? And you probably would define it with lots of different things. But Christian needs to be up there. Christian needs to be something that not only other people identify him with, but he identifies himself with. Getting back to the original purpose of the original idea of what we talked about earlier. We looked at Genesis. We looked at Colossians. We looked at Revelation. The main purpose for us to be here is to serve God, to glorify him to exist and live in his image. That's the purpose of it. And a broad spectrum, that's what Colossians chapter 1 talks about. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 too. When Paul, or when, yeah, when Paul gets really granular and he discusses the individual Corinthian Christians' roles inside the church, he has many, many, many things to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting verse 14. He talks about all the different people. And then he says in verse 14, For the body is not one member, but many. That's a given. It's not just composed of one person. There's a lot of different people. Verse 15, If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it's not for this reason any the less a part of the body. That's sometimes the mentality we have. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it's not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now, listen to this, verse 18, God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. He says that same thing seven verses earlier. And whereas God looks at the church and he says, the church's job is to glorify me. You are the bride of Christ. He also, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, looks at each one of you and says, Joe has a purpose. Jeff has a purpose. Jan has a purpose. You as individuals have a purpose. And so if you ask yourself, what is my purpose? My purpose is a Christian and my purpose is to glorify God. That's great. What's your purpose? Because as he says here in verse 18, God has set the members of the body, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. It should make you feel really good, at least on some level, to know that you are who you are because it pleased God to make you who you are. And obviously, we don't have spiritual gifts in today's world, but we all have talents. We all have expertise. We all have areas that we can really dive into. And the question that we pull out of that is, how are we using our individuality to glorify God? Not our how we as a church. That will take care of itself. But how do we as individuals glorify God? What is my purpose? And so my challenge for everybody here this morning is, is if you're not a Christian, if you've struggled with this very question, and you've looked for some kind of framework by which you can make the decision, start with this. Not by any means the be-all and end-all of the decision. But start with this framework. And I would encourage you as you get to the end of that and truthfully look at every stage of your life and say, well, my life's purpose is to give myself as much pleasure as possible. My life's purpose is to give myself as much money as possible. My life's purpose is to give myself as much status as possible. I would ask you to, once again, look at history. See how that worked out for those people. And then I would ask you to compare that against the people of God. The people who in the Psalms, and like we talked about earlier with Shannon Kelly, the people who towards the end of the life, the farther they got into their life, and ironically, the closer they got to mortality, the more sure they were of their identity in Christ. And the fact that every single thing they did in their life added up to their purpose being found in glorifying God. And I guarantee you, you'll find more happiness and real joy embroiled within that. Give Jesus a chance. Give God a chance, an honest chance. 
and do it as we stand and as we sing.